What's up everybody, Raphael Rau here from Silverwing VFX. Welcome back to another exciting tutorial. That's something I always wanted to do. So in this week's tutorial, what we're going to do is look at the second part of our displacement, which is vertex displacement. Basically, there's nothing else to say but to jump in. So let's grab your coffee and let's jump in. Welcome to this week's tutorial where we talk about vertex displacement. This is in contrast to what we talked about last week, texture displacement. Of course, this video is a continuation from there, so I borrow thoughts that I had in the older one. And if you're not really versed in that, I recommend watching that first. Also, like in part one, we won't touch this scene a lot, because I have other demo scenes in store for you that probably work better. So if you ever wondered what vertex displacement is, let's jump right in. Welcome to Simplified Land. If you watched the first part, you remember this scene. It's the ramp scene. So while Otoy needed some dark magic to do the texture displacement, the vertex displacement is actually much more common ground. And actually, it's all in the name. So while texture displacement is using pixels to deform the surface, the vertex displacement is doing exactly what the name suggests. So if we convert our plane, we have our points or vertices here. So those are at the disposal of the shader to be displaced. This is actually exactly the same as using a Cinema 4D displace modifier inside of the plane and then use a noise with it. Let's make it a little bit bigger so you can see what we're doing. So the couple vertices at hand have now been displaced along the normal, depending on the brightness of the underlying texture, which is the noise in this case. The simple truth is, to get a final result, we need more vertices. Since I converted this plane, let's drop a new one in here. So here we go, and then move the displacer, then delete the old one. Now, this is just a four point polygon basically. So if we go 10 by 10, we have what we had before. And now if we go 50 by 50, you can see we have much more resolution and we can go on. So now that we know how this works, let's actually show in the shader by disabling the displacement, go to our plane and making it 10 by 10 again, then go to the displacement here, set it to vertex displacement at the same height, 100 millimeters. And what I'm going to use here is a octane noise. So let's search for that, this here plug it into the displacement, assign the material. Now, this is a slightly different noise, but we can see this is sort of the same what we had before. In terms of resolution, this is exactly the same as before. So if we up the resolution here, we get more detail in our model. Now, I hear you saying, why even do that in the shader then, when you have the displacer and the resolution basically in Cinema 4D directly? And this is a very valid point, and in some cases, it's even the best thing you can do for displacement. But of course, there are some more options in vertex displacement that lets you create better alternatives through the shader. So, let's have a look at those. To show you this, let's go back with the grid resolution of 10 by 10 and then use the ramp here. Here we go. Let's talk about the most important thing first. Survival. No, of course, if you look at this, I'm talking about resolution. So with a primitive object, the resolution is not a big deal. You can just increase the segments. If you have a base polygon object, however, this becomes more difficult. As a workaround, you could use a SDS object, for example, and you can see the increase in resolution right here. But what if we want to leave our viewport alone and decide to make the resolution just in our shader? Of course, people who worked with vertex displacement before have already spotted it, and this is the inbuilt subdivision level inside of the shader. So usually this is set to zero, and the higher I go, the more resolution I get in my rendering. This is called render time subdivision, and basically it's doing what it says. It subdivides the object during rendering, so your viewport stays snappy and clean. Be careful not to raise this number too high, because other than texture displacement, this one here is actually generating vertices, and therefore, dependent on the mesh density of your model, can have quite a big impact on the performance and resources of your scene, to the point where Octane will freeze and the interface will be unresponsive for multiple minutes. 
To avoid that, what you could do is go to the render settings and lower the max subdivision level. This is also a good setting for troubleshooting scenes that go out of memory or have other troubles rendering, because it limits the render time subdivisions that can be done inside of the scene. But let's go back to topic. As you watch closely, you can still see some stepping here in the gradient. To avoid this, we could of course increase the subdivision level further, but there's a small trick you can use to optically camouflage that, and this is the auto bump. This is an algorithm that evaluates the density of its displacement and pushes detail that cannot be represented with the vertices into a bump map. So your object appears more detailed than it actually is, which you can see on this edge here. Let's address the elephant in the room again. Some of you might have been screaming at your screens for quite a while now, because this slope is supposed to be straight, but it's not. And that is another big difference, and believe it or not, a advantage over the texture displacement, because now we can put in whatever we want into the texture slot here. So whereas before, most of the stuff in the image texture was hardcoded to work with the texture displacement, now we can do stuff as change the gamma here, and therefore get our straight slope. Also, if you remember from part one, the slope we did with the double height in going above white values, this also is now working. All in all, if we break this down, positives, very versatile, negatives, much more resource intensive. Let's look at some more advantages in a rapid fashion. Finally, with vertex displacement, we are not longer bound to use UVs. For example, we can use octane projections as this box projection here. And if you notice unwanted seams, this is not a problem at all, because you can even use triplanar mapping and therefore adjust the angle to your liking. The following point we actually have proven with the double height ramp map. What I wanted to show here is that you could also use negative values. I quickly needed to write this OSL script to show this, but now you can go into negative range even beyond one and in the positive range beyond one and it will follow suit. Very nice. And by the way, this also proves the point that it works with almost anything, also OSL scripts. Unlike in texture displacement, the resolution isn't capped, so in texture displacement this is 8K at maximum. In the vertex displacement, you are bound by the vertices you can produce, and therefore it's basically unlimited if you have enough resources. And last but not least for now, you can see you don't have any strange artifacts, the only thing you could ever have is too low of a resolution. By the way, this was the same scene with texture displacement. Now, before we move into our gacha section, I have two requests for Otoy, so if you're listening, please consider following. Alrighty, here we go. So the first one is, I think, very easy to implement, it's just someone has to do it. As we established in part one, in texture displacement, textures other than raw input textures won't work. So we can use the baking texture to circumvent that, but this isn't giving us the right result if we use multiple projections or UV maps. To prove my point, this is the displacement map I got out of the triplanar, and this is the map that was baked. It looks totally different. And spoiler, it doesn't even have triplanar enabled. You can see the seams here a little bit. The reason why I say that might be easily achievable is because it's already existing in the Octane context. So I've made a baking camera, and if we go to the baking, I have made a tutorial on this by the way, upper right corner, we are baking the triplanar to an existing UV map. This has to be clean by the way. So if I turn off the baking camera for now, and then go back to the main pass and also plug in the triplanar, bring in our bake that we just did, and then plug it into the diffuse you don't see any difference. Since nothing is procedural and everything is baked down to UVs, we can actually pipe it through the texture displacement and get a nice seamless displacement there. So please make this work with the baking texture as well, so we don't have to run through the overhead of saving out a bake first. For the second suggestion, I had to open Blender, because inside of Cycles there is a very neat feature here, which is adaptive vertex displacement. 
And as you can see here, near the camera where we need the most detail, the detail is the highest, and the further we go away, the lower the detail is because we don't need it. In contrast to Octane, where we only have one level of detail, and we need the detail near the camera, the whole plane would have to be subdivided the same level. And this of course costs a lot of resources. I know there is something in the works that is called meshlets that can produce the same result, or even better, but I would consider it highly experimental, so I would opt for something that is a little bit more production proven, like adaptive subdivision here. Welcome to the gacha section. Actually, I don't have too many, though there might be many, as I usually try to work with texture displacement more than with vertex displacement. The first gacha and real sampling block when it comes to vertex displacement is object resolution. As you can see, the displacement can have a vastly different appearance dependent on the base resolution of the object. My first solution would have been to add a octane object tag to the object with the lower resolution, then go to the subdivision surface group and increase the subdivision level. Then I learned something today, and this is that the displacement subdivision level overrides the subdivision level of the tag. So I would say this is half of a gacha. To bring this home, what we could do is go to the subdivision and set this to zero, which should then enable the subdivision level of our object here again. So then what we can do is copy the tag also to our high-res object and be careful to lower the amount here. So then we can have both of those sort of looking the same. Small extra tip for this gotcha. So if you really want to see the resolution of both meshes, what you can do is apply a wire AOV and then go closer because they are both very high res and then you can see whether those match or not. Alrighty, next gacha, and you know the scene from last time. If you ever use vertex displacement with high numbers in conjunction with a STS object, be very careful, as this can act as a massive multiplier. So in the viewport rendering, we have already a very high resolution, but if we set this to the render resolution, then we have to wait and probably run out of memory at some point. While we are at the scene, let's continue here. You can save some resources by using the selection, so polygon selection there, and then use a different material without displacement for the rest of the object. Since we are subdividing the object to displace though, you have to make sure, at least with rounded objects, that the base object is subdivided highly enough, so you don't get any discrepancies that you can see here. So a lower displacement level in the shader and a higher one in the SDS object will smooth this out. And you can see there's still a massive difference in resolution between those both. If you watch the first part, this is our special section. So analog to the first part where we showed the baking texture. Vertex displacement has a special feature as well, and this is vector displacement. So let's plug in the nice funny looking color image here and you can see a blob appearing. And this is a blob because the map type is still set to height. So let's set this to vector space, and we still get a blob, but it's different from side to side. So dependent on the map you're using, we need to change the vector space here. Right now it's set to object, but for this image we need to set it to tangent. So the vector y-axis aligns with the normal position of the polygons. And you can also now see what we are doing. We have a eerie cube now. So vector displacement not only allows us to displace up and down, but into different directions to create, for example, overhanging polygons. To explain this a little bit more in depth, I made my own shader, as vertex displacements takes in every shader. This is quite fine. So as I mentioned before, the green axis or the y axis now aligns with the normal of the object. So if we change the green amount, we get sort of the height that we did with the whole texture before. By the way, if you're wondering what this looks like in the diffuse, so let's plug it in and unplug the displacement. It's just a green circle for now. The more interesting stuff is happening once we mix in some other colors. You can already think of what's happening. So if we go with R, for example, you can see those are now skewed to one side. And of course, the same for the blue channel. So if we go with that, 
then they are skewed to the other side. Now, usually those get into negative range as well, but with the RGB spectrum, we can't do that. So after I had a little bit of a play with it, I basically came up with a poopy cube or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, it's like your creativity doesn't know any bounds here. Hopefully this gave you some inspiration. And again, that's already it for this week. I hope you found something interesting in there. I think I'm going to upload the poopy cube to my Patreon project if you're interested. If everything goes well, next week there's the second part of our knitting tutorial collaboration series, where we're going to do the shading and lighting, so keep an eye out on that. And now, without further ado, let's thank those people who made this video possible. Of course, my Patreons. Especially my 50 euro tier subscribers, Chiels Augustinen, Just a Freakin, and Leon Studio TV. Also, of course, a huge thank you for my 15 euro tier subscribers, for the Thieves, Render King, Alessandro Bonchio, Alessio De Vecchi, BVR, Chris Fritschi, Christian Grajewski, Erbe Plus Academy, George Luna, Graham Bagnell, James Conkle, Joel Mackemer, John Edward, Ludger, Muratan Axos, Nico Straub, Part 1 of 2, Quok an Dang, Ralf, Random Capibara, Raiko, Renato Marquez, Reshock, Shamos Johnson, Shiro 2049, Terry Wayne Ranson, and Yasin Rupp. Thank you all so very much for making it possible to produce those videos that you all enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Vector Drome. There's really not a lot to say today, other than of course the usual in thanking you for staying with me so long. Massive kudos and thanks to you. If you want to show your support, let's post a top arrow in the comments down below. Now, thank you yet again. A wonderful start into this week. And if you watch it whenever, then just simply a fantastic time to you. Let's follow up with the usual and say, have a great time and happy vectorizing. Bye.